How's everybody doing today? This is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. I'm here again to talk black economics, to talk, talk data, um, just to talk real numbers. Essentially, over the last few weeks, there's been a concerted effort, I believe, uh, by, by media as a whole to kind of present a counter-argument to Trump's like statement about the state of black wealth. And inside of doing that, what they're doing is a bit of a disservice to the reality of the black situation and, and, and the economic tragedy that kind of has resulted. I recently released a piece called Black Wealth Hardly Exists, even if you include NBA, NFL, and rap stars. And the reason why I kind of titled it that way, because that should be more than obvious, is it isn't obvious for a whole lot of African Americans. We're at a place where many African Americans believe there are some blacks that are doing poorly and some that aren't. And the data just doesn't support that. What the data shows is that as a race, we're 42 million strong, living in 14 million households, which is like about 2.8 per household. A, a large bulk of our homes have, have minimal amounts of any wealth. I mean, Edward Wolf from NYU, I've shared this with you before, Edward Wolf from NYU, a professor, in his findings, released a working paper in 2014 that showed the middle black family, when you take out all depreciating assets that shouldn't be counted anyway is worth seventeen hundred dollars. So fourteen and a half million homes, over seven million are worth less than seventeen hundred dollars. And so, like when you start like moving up the ladder, what you see, and I'm a, I'm gonna pull up a chart. You know, this chart that I created was from the Brandeis Research Institute along with the Survey of Consumer Finances working together, and they and they they kind of took a a large sampling, and from that they were able to, to, to create kind of a set of numbers, to, a framework, so we can start to understand in percentiles where white people, white families, I should say, stand and where black families stand. And, and unequivocally, what it shows is that black families are not doing well at all, and that white families, pretty much as Demos.org has said before, own everything. So, so Demos.org has shown that the top 10% of white families own almost everything. And then everything else is pretty much owned by the next section of like white people. And I, I believe that the tragedy of the moment is that because of a number of reasons, one of them being black celebrity, what we have is the false belief in the state, the stability of black America, the stability of young blacks that went to college, that went to Howard, that went to UCLA, versus the reality of what the numbers are showing us. You know, um... In my piece, what I do is I, I, I break down a lot of numbers. I do recommend, again, go to your web. Your web, put it out as is. A lot of the uh, other sites, what I found is they, they just didn't want to hit hard. And this hits hard because, you know, Lee over there, he does good work. And, and, and what, I, what I wanted to do was give black people a place where they can see all the numbers just laid out. You know, numbers like what we see is black home ownership is at a 20-year low of 41.7%. 41.7%. White people own homes at about 75%. White families, 75% of white families own their house. But 41% of blacks own their house. That is lower than the rate, the national rate during the Depression. That's, that, that's, that means that that number is a, a tragic number in the wealthiest country the world is known. And so, meaning America. And so what we, what we, what we see is like different data points are telling us that we need to really, really be awake. Whether Obama is in office, whether Jay-Z and Beyonce are married, we need to get away from looking at individual celebrity exceptionalism and look at our own personal situations, our own communities, structural stability, and come to an awareness that we are not doing well today. People over at IPS, Institute for Policy Studies, Chuck Collins, Josh Hoxie, a few others, you know, I, I write on inequality.org and those are the editors. They did a phenomenal piece of work just recently this month. And what it showed is that for a black family to catch up to the average white family, for an average black family to catch up to the average white family today, it would take 228 years on the path that we're on today. For them to catch up to the wealth that that white family has in 2016. So what that does presume is that, you know, white people would stand still to create some kind of parity, but they're not standing still. Because if you look at another piece of data that came out from Tom Shapiro of Black Wealth, White Wealth, recommend picking up the book. Um, and and, and what, what his data showed is that from 1983 to 2009, for every $1 of increased income, what you ended up seeing is that 
in a black household, that one dollar in increased income only led to 69 cents more in wealth. But for a white family, every dollar increased in income led to almost five dollars more in wealth. So what would that do over that 200 plus years? That would just increase the gap exponentially. That means we're not catching up under this economic like plan or, or this economic like path that we're on as a, as a country. What they're saying is that, well, to get to this day that white people are at, it would take y'all 228 years if it just stood still. But the world isn't standing still. And black America needs to start understanding that the world's not standing still. And that's kind of the point of why I do these videos and why I, I do the pieces I do is, is to start telling our people, not only are you doing are, are you not doing well, but we are not on a, a pathway that allows for us to forget progress. I don't know if it allows for us to survive based on the aspirational dreams we have. You know, um, we as a group have framed so much of our identity through and by black celebrity. Um, I got a piece coming out on the Grio tomorrow speaking on Floyd Mayweather. Uh, shout out to Byron Allen and David Wilson and Todd Johnson, all the great people at the Grio for letting me put that out. But like, really, you look at what Floyd said, which is all lives matter, but he said more than that. It's going to be in the piece. Check it out in the morning on the Grio. And, you know, essentially, what Floyd was saying is you need to follow the rules. Now, the, the criticism I have is similar to the one I have for Lil Wayne, who says racism doesn't exist, is you're running into a conundrum. And what I, what I, uh, that, and that conundrum is, I believe over the next four, few years, I believe that over the next few years, black America will have to face an existential identity crisis of how they see black celebrity. Meaning, how they see black celebrity as a reflection of their own lives. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is that for 25 years, what we've done is created an identity that there is some success because there's a few successful celebrities. And what that has done in exchange is made it so the mass group of blacks that are struggling, their stories are not getting told. You know, and, and I, I don't think that we understand the gravity of how white America becomes apathetic because of a singular Beyonce. Or NBA star that signs a $100 million contract that's shown everywhere. Nobody shows us how much the Koch brothers made last year everywhere, every day. Nobody shows us uh, how much uh, Bill Gates made last year. They show us like what his worth is, but we don't see a, like he, he got this check and then they show the check on, on a gossip site. We see that with black people. You know, and a lot of that comes back to because we don't have much, we want to celebrate anything. But that's not your celebration. That's what Floyd Mayweather and Lil Wayne are saying out loud. They're saying that we are not of you. We are of America. And what black America, that largely by the numbers, is poor or working poor, will have to start to realize is that we're not of you either. And I, I think that that's a, a hard pill to swallow for black America because for 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 multiple generations, you know, we were all treated as as like as blacks, as as others. What has happened through this transition of the '90s is a progress where money, and education, combined can kind of buy you out of that in some senses. Now the tragedy is that in the end, there's still a ceiling. You know, Byron Allen bringing lawsuits against Charter and Comcast more than illuminates that. You know, y'all can have a y'all can have a part ownership, a small part ownership in a channel, but don't bring no whole channel over here anymore where you're going to bring positive messages to yourself. But at the same time, what you see is that Black America has created also an identity based on a, a very fractional small group of people. You know, a, an identity that I too can be a millionaire. Let me give you what I mean. Let me pull up a chart. So I'm pulling up the chart that I created again where it kind of gives you the data. When you look at the bottom, to get into the million dollar status, you got to be in the top 1% of black families. Now, those black families are not what you think. Those aren't just like celebrities. Those are fractional amount. Thomas Piketty has a book out called Capital in the 21st Century. 
set the whole wealth inequality world by storm last year. New York Times lists like most of the year. In it, what he shows is that of all the top earners last year, the top 0.1% of earners, only 5% were celebrities like singers, basketball players, football players. Only 5%. 70% of that group, of that top group of earning power, were super managers. Super managers are people that are CEOs or next to line in line to be the CEO of a company. So we all fighting to be basketball players or or, or some kind of like singer when all the real slots to make money in this country are CEOs and super managers. But what we don't understand is that it's not just as easy as our choice. These are positions where the people that are in them are selecting who's next. So Bloomberg does this report that I combined to show that all these super managers are almost white people. Like 90% are either white men or white women in this country. So that means they making most of the money and they have most of the money. That's a bad math. So what Bloomberg showed is that of the S&P 500, S&P 500 is a set of companies that represents... The, the the top of America. You know, you got Time Warner in there. You got, you got, a, you go look it up. And so, of the S&P 500 companies, only 1%, 5, might be down to 4 when she falls out the Xerox, uh, the Xerox CEO leaves. 5 African Americans are CEOs. Only 2.6% of the, all the, of all the top slots that are next in line to be CEO are black, African American. What does that tell you? It tells you that we don't have that many people as super managers. So we don't even have that many people making money. Because those are the people making money. And so we come to this reality that there's two kind of people that are making money. People that hold capital and people that are super managers. We're neither of those. So what does that mean for our future? You know, um, the data shows, like, like if we really look at the framework set by the, by, by, by the uh, survey of consumer finances and Brandeis Research, that there's 80 million white families. Of the 80 million white families, 8 million are worth a million four or more. 8 million households. Of the 14 million black households, we're not even dealing with the 7.5 million out of the 14 million that are worth 1,700 or less. Of the 14 million black households, a few hundred thousand, maybe 200,000 are worth more than a million something. That's the tragedy of it all. And so, like, where we're at is a place where, I mean, we're at a place where we don't own much land. I've written on that. You know, white folks own 98% of the agricultural land worth 97% of the money uh, or the value of land. We're at a place where we don't produce many goods. We have no import-export advantages. And we're saying, and people say to me all the time, what's the solution? I'm telling you, this is, this is economic tragedy, that there, this isn't about solutions. This is about understanding your position. And so we come to this, to this place where, interestingly enough, just today, CNN releases... This this sobering like like piece that I recommend everybody to, to go read called uh, "It's Lonely in the Top One Percent for Black People," and, and, and their numbers, you know, very similar to the ones I found. You know what they show is there's 124 million American households as a whole. That's what we know. So the top one percent is the top what 1.2 million households, right? So we are African Americans are 1.5, 1.7 percent of that top group. That's about like, if you think about it, we're talking about 1.2 million households, 150, 160,000 homes. And the thing is, they're not singers and dancers. Don't think, they're not basketball players. These are older boomers. These are boomers that got in during the affirmative action era, got some contracts, got some advantages of a black community being different. They're not millennials. You're, uh, I, I, it's negligible the amount of millennial blacks that are worth a million dollars. When I say negligible, probably under 20,000 homes. And we've seen them all on TV. 
So coming back to like the guts of it, what 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 this whole prognosis is, what this what what this is is, we as black people are going through an awakening. I'm just saying that you open your eyes. I give you the data. All you gotta do is read it, and when you read it, if it makes you feel a certain kind of way, let that feeling through you. Don't close your eyes to it because the data is real and it's and, and, and it's, it's it's sobering. But it's also frustrating. And maybe it's time for us to get a little frustrated so we demand some changes. Because black people aren't going to do well on this path that we're on right now. Thank you so much for listening.